The Corsair Void Pro headset features comfortable microfiber, mesh fabric, and memory foam ear cups, custom-tuned 50mm neodymium drivers with Dolby Headphone 7.1 surround support, and a unidirectional noise-canceling microphone with LED mute indicator. Available in RGB and wireless trim too, so click the link in the description for more information. How's it going guys? Welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul episode number 19, my monthly Q&A video where I answer questions that you guys ask usually in last month's video. So going back to last month, which was episode 18, I always seem to get a screen cap with my eyes closed apparently for this, but these are all of the history of Probing Paul's going back many, many years. So uh, check them out, I guess, if you want me to answer other random questions. For today, I'm going to dive right into it. Again, all these were uh, asked in last month's video in the comment section, so if you have uh, questions you want me to answer for next month, leave them down there. Starting off with Austin Schaffner who asks, Could AMD put the Vega 56 or 64 chips on a PCB with GDDR5, as far as the, the video memory? Or are these chips designed only to work with one type of VRAM? The only reason I would suggest this is lower costs and to cut MSRP, allow better yields. I feel like HBM2 is extreme overkill. Seems almost pointless right now. Now the decision to go with HBM2 memory by uh, AMD or Radeon Technologies Group was made pretty early on from my understanding. And uh, it was definitely a risk that did not pay out. AMD is kind of known for doing stuff like this in the past. I mean, go all the way back to them being the first ones to integrate the memory controller onto the, uh, the process processor um, and other steps that they've made a uh, 64-bit processing um, that kind of thing they've done some cool stuff in the past HBM2 memory doesn't stand out as one of their best decisions now for any benefits that HBM2 might have as far as the increased amount of bandwidth that's it's, it's available uh, and the performance in some games it's probably going to be some time before we see the software catching up to sort of take more advantage of the uh, hardware's capabilities and like we've uh, heard from lots of sources, uh, although maybe not directly from Radeon Technologies Group, is that HBM2 yields are low, and that's led to uh, difficulty bringing the product to market. Now, when it comes to the actual physical capability of what the GPU can do, um, the GPU was designed with a memory controller that's integrated, and that memory controller only works with HBM2. So it's not something where they could just take it and swap out that memory. There's benefits that are gained there, but it's just not paid out here for AMD. So I think that's a big reason why we're seeing limited availability of Vega 56 and 64 chips. And I don't know, uh, hopefully that improves in the future, but it's just one of those future things that we're not really sure what the answer is going to be. So thank you for your question though. Next up from Everything is Fire. Hey Paul, if you weren't a tech tuber, uh, would you still have a system or systems with enthusiast grade parts? 1080 Ti's, Intel X processors, dual GPUs, and extravagant water loops, for example. Wouldn't know if you were in uh, if you were into videography or very into gaming before making your channels. Um, so there's multiple parts to answer this question. Um, I would say yes, but definitely not to the extreme that I have right now. Um, if I go back historically, I have purchased top-end graphics part cards before, before I was into the tech world very much, but I was into computers. So like I bought a, a 7800 GTX back in the day, NVIDIA graphics card that was like 500 bucks at the time. That was a huge investment for me because I was, you know, wasn't making a ton of money at the time and everything. Uh, I have, I was, I was an early adopter of Intel's enthusiast platform back when they introduced X56 and uh, their, their first enthusiast uh, class stuff with their triple channel memory, uh, and that was Nahalem, and I got an i7-920. But this is kind of where the, the, the genesis of like, I've done a few entry level, like I did an entry level X399 build, theoretical build recently. I did an entry level X99 build, and I'm probably gonna do something similar with, uh, with X299, but the idea is for people who are into computers, you see that enthusiast class of hardware is like, man, that's that's where the real power players go and the people who are like impractical with how they spend the money and they don't really care if they're gonna make use of it. They just want like a really, really fast computer. Like I have some level of appreciation for that, but I also understand that if you're trying to invest in that type of hardware, it's really expensive. So you gotta kinda figure out what you can invest in um, if you are just buying the stuff outright yourself. Now things I probably wouldn't do, extravagant water loops is something that I always had a fascination for and a vague interest in, 
but never any inclination to investing my own money in. So that's probably something that I w wouldn't have dove into if it wasn't for like the connection I originally got two years ago when I originally built Arctic Panther. Uh, Jay helped me uh, kind of figure out how to actually put it together and do the hardline uh, tube bending and everything. He also put me in touch with EK and they sponsored the build. So water cooling is one of those things where the price to performance doesn't pan out quite as much and it's 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 that extra notch up of enthusiast level and I would say that's probably something that it would have taken a bit more for me to get into um, if it wasn't for the fact that I did YouTube and stuff but videography I've been interested in going all the way back to college I actually went to college for for cinema television and that was a big reason why I built my own computers because like I didn't like going into the lab to edit and stuff like that I'd rather have my own computer that I built and like be able to edit in my dorm room or whatever but yeah I I, I, I really enjoy this stuff and I don't think I could do what I do as often as I do if I didn't actually uh, think it was pretty cool and everything. All right, next question from Nick has arrived. Are you ever gonna do home automation? He says, it is very fun. Uh, that is, all right, so a, a good question and something that I have speculated about getting into. So let's start from the negative side first. I follow uh, on Twitter, Internet of Shit, and Internet of Shit on Twitter is a really funny account to follow because he'll point out all of the snafu situations that have people have gotten into because manufacturers like sticking uh, Wi-Fi into everything now and giving them internet access and being a part of the internet of things home automation when it comes to like uh, like like keys you know like the the, the the remote locks they have and that kind of thing I'm a little bit sketchier about um, I'm not quite ready to take a lot of the vital functions of my home and give them internet internet access and that kind of thing. I'm a little bit more curious about DIY stuff, sort of making things that function in your home using technology, but that's not necessarily part of some larger scheme or some big company that sold you the product or something like that. So maybe I might get into something like that. I know that's a little vague, but I haven't I haven't really researched it too much. What I am in the process, I've just started the process of doing right now is upgrading my entire electrical system in the home. So I'm gonna get a Tesla Powerwall. I've already put a deposit down on that. And I'm gonna be getting a solar put in and then we also have some some home improvement plans that are in the works. So I'm probably going to document a lot of that stuff. And I do plan on trying to integrate technology to some degree. So home automation is probably going to be part of that. And it's just going to be like, we'll, we'll see how far I go with it. And also kind of what I'm familiar with, because like I said, I don't want I don't want Internet connected locks on my home, for example. I'm not I'm not quite to that point yet. Um, but yeah, hopefully that gives you a good answer. Nick, thank you for the question. Moving on to the next question. Peter Nowak, Piotr, Piotr Nowak. I hope I'm pronouncing that okay. Hi, Paul. I built my PC as a budget rig some time ago. I switched from the G3258, a very, very capable dual-core uh, entry-level CPU, to an i7-4790K. My question, is there a point to changing my motherboard? Will I increase performance when I switch from an MSI B85 PC mate to some Z97 chipset based motherboard? By the way, nice, nice content. Keep up the good work. Uh, thank you very much, Piotr. So I believe this is the motherboard, the MSI uh, B85 G41 PC Mate from MSI, a budget motherboard, but you know it's got all the basic functions that you kind of want on there. But it is limited by the chipset, uh, which is the Intel B85 chipset, which is a business chipset, which is not part of Intel's scheme for having fully unlocked overclocking capabilities. So for that, you need to upgrade to a Z97 motherboard, but is that really worth it? Um, Z97 is sort of on its way out, you can tell, because Newegg has some of them still around and hanging out in stock, but most of them are refurb models. There is an ASRock that you can buy new for about $125. Pricing is a little all over the place, but maybe not necessarily the best pricing if you're comparing it to modern stuff right now. So the answer to your question is, do you want to overclock? If you want to overclock, if you're interested in that, and if you've got an, you know, $100, $125 to spare, then sure, maybe upgrade your motherboard, pop it in there, uh, and then you can maybe get a little bit more performance out of your CPU. Bear in mind, if you do that, you're probably going to want an aftermarket CPU cooler, um, which you can get away with for $30 to $40. Um, and then you also might consider that if you already have Windows installed on the system and activated, if you swap your motherboard, there's a good chance you will need a new copy of Windows to install on that new system because uh, the software will look at it as a new system completely. So that's kind of your trade-offs. I would say since you've got a 4790K that already runs at a pretty decent uh, clock speed as it is, 
Um, unless you really, really just want to dive into overclocking, you're probably fine as is and just, you know, hang out with your system because you've got a pretty capable system right now. Give it another year or two and then kind of look at the landscape and see if there's any upgrade options that make sense to you for upgrading your platform overall. Next up is Dylan. By God, uh, what would be some good jobs or degrees to get into if someone wanted to work in the hardware aspect of computers rather than software or data? All right, big old grain of salt with my recommendations here because like I said, I went to college for cinema television. So uh, I'm gonna kind of give you high level recommendations here. If you want to work with soft or with hardware, you're gonna want to be focused on engineering and you're gonna be focused on science. So uh, physics, uh, just just the, the fundamentals of how electricity works, uh, the fundamentals of design, because that's a lot of the stuff that goes into actually developing the hardware to function properly. Um, if you're looking at jobs, then I would definitely say consider uh, some entry-level positions at uh, actual computer manufacturers. And then beyond that, don't ignore software completely. Um, that's actually a mistake that I would say I've made in the past. I am not very good at like coding or the software side. I have a you know a decent grasp of the fundamentals, but you know I can't go in and write my own code for for the most part. So I would say. Keep that in mind because they do pair together very closely, and you don't want to get too uh, you don't want to have too much knowledge on one side without the other. So I hope some of that information has been vaguely helpful. Uh, but let's move on to the next question. This is what I call the AMD fanboys lament right now. And sorry, I bull guy, I didn't mean to like specifically call you a fanboy, but you do say you do start out by saying, "What does a diehard fan of AMD like me do in this case?" And this is just the, 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 the PC building landscape right now. He doesn't have a GPU. He has a full built computer. His RX 480 died and he had to return it. And apparently he hasn't been able to get it replaced. So I'm not sure what the deal is there. He wanted to wait for Vega. It's been six months. There's no Vega. Now that it's actually out, they're really overpriced. He wanted to buy a Vega 64, uh, but yeah. So he's a click away from buying a 1080 Ti since he's been saving for so long, but he's just not sure whether he should take the plunge or not. He says, I still hate NVIDIA simply because they're dominating the market. I don't think that's a reason to hate a company, but I mean, I can understand that if you're into AMD, I mean, they, they, they've, they've done some stuff in the past that a lot of people have looked at, like their support for open source and that kind of thing. But yeah, AMD has put anyone who's a big time AMD fan in a pretty difficult situation right now, where the only practical graphics cards to invest in are gonna be like in the, sub hundred dollar range or right around that range some super cheap stuff that's still available or four hundred dollars plus and even four hundred dollars plus the only practical stuff is like a gtx 1070 which you can actually get for around four hundred dollars or gtx 1080 or gtx 1080 ti because amd's high-end options vega 56 and vega 64 are all grossly overpriced pretty much everywhere you look and i believe that is still the case as of this morning so i'm gonna actually direct my my answer here to amd rather than to fans of AMD. Because AMD, look at the situation that this person is in. Eyeball guy, the only direct like, like advice I could give to you is unless you're ready to drop the money on a FreeSync monitor right now, a FreeSync monitor and an overpriced Vega card might balance out to be somewhere in the range of what you could also buy a GTX 1080 and a G-Sync monitor for that are kind of equivalent. I know that's general again, and there's lots of specifics you could get in and say yes or no, but that's kind of what we're looking at here. If you're investing in FreeSync, then maybe you could you could make the justification to buy a Vega cart. If not, dude, drop the money on that 1080 Ti because it's significantly faster than a Vega 64 and it's available and you can buy it. It's not ridiculously overpriced compared to the MSRP that NVIDIA uh, originally came out with it for. So this is where I think AMD is going to suffer the most in this current situation. They're going to have fans who are really put in a spot where they have no other practical choice but to invest in the competition's hardware. And once they've done that and tried it out and tested it, what's it going to take to get them to go back to AMD? And I think that's the biggest question right now. But, you know, that's going to play out in the next few months as we continue to watch uh, the prices of graphics cards and whatnot. All right. What is your favorite PC you've ever built? Asks the Obsidian Sword. I like your, uh, I like your avatar here, too. Um, all right. So this made me think back on many, many PCs I've built in the past. I, of course, have fond places in my heart for all of them, going all the way back to the Hewlett-Packard 
system that my dad bought, which we, I didn't really build, so I guess that one doesn't count. count. But point being, there's lots of systems I've used over the year that that uh, over the years that I um, am a little bit nostalgic for. But uh, Arctic Panther, I think, has to take the cake for this one. Um, I I don't have them all right here. The 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 case is over there. Here's the power supply. Um, it is continue. It is continuing to be a work in progress. Originally built a little over two years ago. My first ever water cooling system, full water cooled, uh, full loop water cooled system that I ever built with hardline tubing. Did more case modding than I've ever done with any system before. I'm still modding the case. I just posted a video, uh, I think yesterday, uh, where I added a USB Type C uh, port to my Define R5. So yeah. It's, it's got to be Arctic Panther. It's just investment of time. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a ton of stuff doing that build, and I've definitely gained a huge appreciation uh, for the guys who do like uh, full custom mods all the time because um, it's a huge labor of love. And uh, I think, I think yeah, uh, that, that pretty much hopefully answers your question. Final question here from Alex Collins. Uh, this one's a little off topic, so bear, bear with me. But uh, hey, Paul, is it Hold Me Closer, Tiny Dancer? or hold me closer, Tony Danza? Or is it meant to be both? These are the questions that need answers in life. And Alex, I'm happy to inform you that I'm gonna be able to provide a definitive answer to this question right now. Now, Elton John, Sir Elton John, uh, forgive me, Sir Elton Hercules John to be specific, uh, came out with his hit classic song, Tiny Dancer, in 1971 on the album Madman Across the Water. Now, uh, Elton John hails from England. He is English. Tony Danza. Uh, famous American actor and boxer, uh, was born in 1951 in Brooklyn, New York. So at the time when Tony Danza, or when Tiny Dancer came out, uh, uh, Tony Danza would have been about 20 years old in 1971. Now, he actually got famous or was originally known for his role in Taxi. Uh, Taxi is a TV series actually uh, role, uh, was, was on TV from 78 to 82. This was all before my time in case you're wondering, by the way. Um, so, based on all this, I have to say, I, I'm going to say it's Tiny Dancer, not Tony Danza. I don't think Elton John would have been aware of Mr. Danza's work by that time. Although, who knows? Maybe maybe Tony went and took a trip to England, you know, in his late teens and met uh, a young Elton John. And maybe that was where, where it was where it was all sourced from. I was not able in my limited research uh, to find any definitive uh, evidence of that, however. So... Uh, I'm going to say Tiny Dancer. That's, that's what I'm going with. But guys, that is all for this uh, sort of strangely ending episode of Probing Paul. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, hit the thumbs up button. And of course, don't forget to leave me some questions for next, next month. Uh, I'll be perusing those very soon. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.